Holly Hager and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please raise your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Deputy Director of the Department of Military History, Mark Gerges. Well, thank you. I have to do double duty today because there's actually two of our uh, professors who are here uh, going to talk. And before I start that, I just want to thank you all for coming out um, and uh, the long-term relationship we've had with the Dole Institute. Um, is, is something that we really uh, value. Uh, it's an opportunity for our professors to get out here and show off a little bit of their research and their expertise. I was on their website, or actually their YouTube page last week, looking at um, all of the YouTube videos, and they have it all entitled the uh, Fort Leavenworth uh, series, and there's over 90. I think this is the 91st one, so two and a half weeks of working, full-time job to watch all the videos, uh, which is fantastic. So thank, uh, thanks to Dole Institute for, uh, uh, for allowing us to come here. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Derek Mallett. Uh, he currently teaches at the U.S. Army. We have three satellite campuses. Uh, two of them are at, at Fort Belvoir, and one is at uh, Redstone Arsenal. Um, and he is at the satellite campus at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Just came in this morning for this talk. Um, he received his Ph.D. in military history from Texas A&M, um, excuse me, Ph.D. in history from Texas A&M University, uh, and his research interests include the Second World War, prisoners of war, military intelligence, and war in public memory. Um, he did three years as a research historian for the Joint Prisoner of War Missing in Action Accountability Command in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, he's the author of Hitler's Generals in America, Nazi POWs, and Allied Military Intelligence. Uh, and he's currently working on an edited uh, collection of essays concerning uh, issues surrounding prisoners of war and other civilian internees in the early 20th century. Um, he also is the executive consultant for a, uh, a, a, a documentary, upcoming feature-length documentary film, uh, Hitler's Reluctant Emissaries, German Prisoners of War in the United States. Uh, Dr. Lange Riotto is an assistant professor of military history at the U.S. Army Command General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. Um, she specializes in the American Civil War, uh, Prisoners' War, and Memory Studies. She reserved, received her Ph.D. in American History from the University of Akron, um, and then before she joined the faculty of the Command General Staff College last year, she worked as a historian at Army University Press uh, on their films team, which made uh, documentaries that taught military history and doctrine uh, that's available on YouTube and, uh, and, and is for the education of military officers, but it's also very good history, so uh, and, uh, I encourage you to look at it. Um, her research focuses on the American Civil War prisoners of war and their narratives of uh, captivity. Some of her more recent publications include As Happy a Man as Ever Was, War Confederate Gray, uh, Confederate Ex-Prisoners of War and Their Narratives and Imprisonment from 1877 to 1890, uh, in Useful Captives, the Role of POWs in American Military Conflicts with the University Press of Kansas, uh, and teaching the Army uh, virtual training tools to train and educate 21st century soldiers in military review. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mount, Dr. Rieto. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Um, and before we get started, I do want to thank the Dole Institute um, for having us here. I've watched pretty much all the YouTube videos, so maybe almost 90, and it's such an honor to actually be here and speaking to you all. And also thank you to Dr. Derek Mallet for inviting me to do this talk along with him. We met several years ago, and you might be surprised there's not many POW historians out there, and we all know each other. So I'm excited um, to be here with him today. <laughs> 
Um, so I am going to be talking about Civil War POWs. And the way that this works with the, the Dole Institute series this year, the periphery of war, is because POWs, especially from the Civil War, are usually not included in the dominant narrative of the war, right? They even exist on the periphery of that narrative because they, they are not the brave, valiant soldiers that fought on the battlefield, right? They're seen as cowards, people who surrendered, people who were captured. So they spent most of their lives trying to challenge that narrative and prove that you know, they have some value, right? They are not cowards, right? So what I'm gonna talk about today is how even when they were prisoners, they tried to share information that they would hope would be actionable military intelligence, right? And then after the war, they do, do spend a lot of time trying to prove themselves and that they do have some value as part of American history and history of the American Civil War. So, a few things I'm gonna talk about today. One, um, in contrast to what Dr. Derek Mallet is going to talk about, there are no formal interrogations as part of the American Civil War. And there's definitely no tapping, right? There's, the technology does not exist yet unless we wanna think about a cup and a string. Like, even then, they're not listening <laughs> into prisoners' conversations, and they're not interrogating them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we're gonna talk about information collected upon capture and or surrender. They are not the same thing. Um, prisoners will definitely claim that they were captured against their will rather than surrendered. Um, we're gonna talk about information they tried to share while they were within prison, right? So we're gonna talk about invisible ink, letters, trying to smuggle out information. And then we're also gonna wrap up after prison. So either after escape or after release or special exchange, kind of the information they tried to share to help military and government officials in fighting the war. Hmm? So why are there no interrogations? There's several reasons for this. One is just they don't need to ask prisoners what unit they're from because if they're on the battlefield, they can see the flag, right? They know that's the 15th Mississippi they can see the main unit. If they do capture someone and they maybe want to know where the main force is, they also have scouts and other reconnaissance means of finding that out, right? They don't need to ask the person they just captured. Some stories are maybe if they capture a picket, right, someone further out in the line and they want to know maybe where the main force is located, they may do some initial questioning, but again, they really don't need to ask soldiers they're capturing for that information. There's other ways of collecting that information, okay? There are some famous stories about like Gettysburg. One prisoner claimed that Robert E. Lee himself rode up to a column of prisoners being like, where's Meade's line? That probably didn't happen. But the fact that he even told that story says that maybe some of this initial questioning did occur, right? Um, another reason it doesn't happen is the Lieber Code, General Order Number 100, which I know a few of you already heard about from when Dr. Ben Schneider and Dr. Mark Hull were here, um, actually had rules against interrogating prisoners, especially using torture, right? They were very clear about how to treat combatants, especially prisoners of war. So we're not going to see painful, violent interrogation of prisoners, right? So I just have a picture up here of the code and then, of course, this famous painting by Homer, which was painted and then published in 1866, showing a Union soldier talking to a few Confederate soldiers upon capture and maybe asking some initial questions. But again, these initial questions are not going to be, what unit are you from? Where's the rest of the line? How many of there are you? How many cavalry had? Those are not the type of questions you're gonna see. If anything, it's more of camaraderie, right? Because actually soldiers on the field of battle, even if on the other side, they're formerly enemies, actually had a lot of friendly <coughs> conversations. And prisoners would often claim that they were well treated by the people they were captured by or who they surrendered to because they were fellow soldiers who fought on the front line. It was once they got to prison that they would claim that there would be villains at the prison, right? The prison guards, the prison commandants. But oftentimes they would talk about, oh, they would share coffee with the people who captured them. They would tell stories about home, 
Um, they would talk about why they were fighting. So I'm not going to show the clip in, um, for the sake of time, but if anyone knows um, the movie Gettysburg, right? At the end of the film, they show Thomas Chamberlain, so Joshua Chamberlain's brother, go up to a number of Confederate prisoners and start talking to them. And this is supposed to be kind of the end of the war, signal the, um, not the end of the war, the end of the movie, right? End of the battle and showing a little bit of reconciliation. And he goes up and the individuals are actually dressed just like these guys in the painting. I think it's the same hat that they have the guys dressed up in. And they're talking about, oh, why are you fighting? And it's not meant for interrogative purposes. It's just curiosity, right? Just talking to the people that they just fought a very bloody battle against. And he's like, oh, what unit are you from? And the guy gladly answers, the 15th Mississippi, right? Where are you from originally? Oh, I'm from Maine. I've never been to Maine. A friendly conversation. And then he asks, oh, why are you fighting? Right? Hollywood magic, why are you fighting? He goes, oh, for my rats. And he goes, well, you're what? You're rats? <laughs> no, you're rights. But again, maybe this nice conversations happen, but it's not for information. It's not to gather intelligence to fight the battle or fight the war. Right? So again, they did collect some military intelligence at capture and surrender. Um, and the reason I'm telling you, like, they're not being interrogated, but there is information being collected and shared. And this is because the prisoners themselves are very aware that they are now being taken behind enemy lines, and maybe what they're seeing and experiencing may be useful to their own military officials. So not to the enemies, they're not being interrogated, but maybe what they're seeing and they're writing down they can share with their commanders when they get back to their units. So things they're gonna be talking about. One is what does, for example, the Confederacy look like from the inside, right? So I have this image, it's from Harper's Ferry and it's showing prisoners being brought through um, a southern town and what they're seeing or what they might possibly be seeing. So prisoners are going to record, are the people well fed? Right? What do the children look like? What are they wearing? Are there a number of enslaved people, um, free people of color? Are there units in those towns? Are they defendant towns? This is some of the information that they're going to be taking note of and possibly recording, especially before the exchange is suspended in 1863. Many of these individuals are going to be only briefly imprisoned and then quickly paroled and sent back to their units. So everything they're seeing, they're going to be remembering and then sharing, possibly to use as military intelligence. So if they're pushed through Richmond, they're going to be taking note. What does the tram transport system look like? How many units are in the city? What do the defenses look like? Especially as they're getting further into the south, like once we have Salisbury <coughs> Prison in North Carolina, um, Florence in South Carolina, Fort um, Camp Sumter, which is known as Andersonville in Georgia, and they're moving along the rail lines in the south, Union prisoners are definitely paying attention to what they're seeing. Same thing with Confederate prisoners in the north. They're paying attention to how many troops are they seeing. Are the trains well stocked? Are they moving on time? Some things that are being recorded. Another thing that they're paying attention to um, and they're going to be reporting back, is if they have any equipment, money, or supplies confiscated, right? So especially when they arrive, for example, in Libby Prison, there's going to be notes of the Commandant of Libby Prison and an, especially Dick Turner, who's kind of his sidekick, um, confiscating personal property from the prisoners. And one reason of this is the Confederates just want Yankee money, they want greenbacks, right? So if you have $7, we're taking your $7. But they would also take watches, um, nice coats. There's one famous story on the way to prison, um, a Confederate soldier actually just like pops out of the woods, comes up to a few Union prisoners and says, I need new pants and I need new boots. I'll give you some Confederate money for them. They pass over the clothes and then the guys take them and then disappears back into the woods <laughs> with this stuff. They're also recording that. And what does that tell us? One, the Confederate soldiers are themselves struggling. If they don't have new boots, if they don't have pants, if they don't have money, what does that tell us about how the Confederacy is fighting their war, right? How the war effort is going. So this image that I'm showing you up here is actually a claim. So from Libby Prison, again, number of confiscations, about 700 total are in the National Archives. 
and prisoners after the war would write in and say, they stole $7 from me, my pocket watch, and I want to be reimbursed. So I wanted to know how many people made up that they had pocket watches, right? Um, how much money did they actually have on them? But they are sharing this information, and they hope once it gets back to military officials, maybe they can make an assessment on the enemy's war effort. That's the image. But trying to share intelligence does not end once they get to prison. You would think it would, right? But it doesn't. Um, they are going to be still trying to get information out of prison. One way they do this is pretty common. They write letters. And especially when the war kicks off, both governments are not prepared for the number of prisoners they're going to take. And they don't really know how to handle prisoners. So they let prisoners write whatever they want. <laughs> Um, I mean like five page letters, finally they get on, well maybe we should stop that, maybe we should censor what they're sending out to their families and either to their commanders, right? So they're gonna say, all right, one page, okay? And then they start censoring it. Make sure you can't tell them exactly where the prison is located, right? Um, make sure, don't say what you're being fed or who the commandant of the prison is. You're gonna be censoring information. So how do prisoners get around this? Invisible ink. And they actually do, they use vinegar, lemon juice, urine. So um, if you ever think of National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, where they're looking at the cipher on the back of the Declaration of Independence and they heat it up. So acid, it will disappear, but once you heat up the page, you can read it. And that worked for a while until one guy, you know, one guy has to ruin it for everybody, wrote PS, then heat up this letter afterwards so you can read the rest of it. <laughs> so maybe don't do that. Um, but you see letters where the text on the letter is only this much and the rest is invisible ink, which is super fun. So that's one way to get out information. The other way is I have a picture here of supposed to be a spy. They would often, sometimes they would get female visitors or enslaved people coming into the prisons or even free people of color and they would give inf messages to them to take to military officials or actually smuggle letters out, especially in women's skirts. Right? This actually was very common in St. Louis. There was a number of Confederate prisoners held there, um, and they would try to give it to Confederate sympathizers, especially women. A number of those women then were captured and then sent to the very same prison that they were smuggling information out of. So it didn't go too well for them, but they did try. Right? But again, this is information about rations, how they're being treated. Um, especially if they're held in Libby, they can actually see Richmond. So what do the defenses of Richmond look like? How many transports do they see? How many units are moving in and out of the city? Some of them, especially from Chicago, Camp Douglas, you're hearing Confederate prisoners held in Camp Douglas in Chicago talking about, wow, like Chicago is a bustling industrial city. Maybe the United States is doing really well and we shouldn't be fighting against them because they're having no issues supplying their troops and supplying their people when we are. Right? So maybe some, all, some of the intelligence that they're getting is not as helpful to the war effort, except maybe we should stop fighting. Right? So that does happen as well. And this is one thing I wanted to share. It's a quote from Henry Davidson because Henry Davidson is going to publish not only during the war, he's going to send letters and he keeps a diary, but after the war he is also going um, to publish his memoir based on the letters and diaries he kept. And it's about how it's not only military officials and government officials that they want to inform, it's the public. Because they don't think the public really knows what is happening in these prisons. So he's talking about he will do all in his power to spread abroad knowledge of our treatment. So especially people know of Andersonville, the horrific treatment that you see there. Um, and arouse the sympathies of our friends to action in our behalf, right? And saying like, go to your congressman going to your local leaders and stressing to them how badly we are suffering and try to get a change in policy. So this is again, like I said, going to continue after the war, where, not after the war, after prison, excuse me. Um, this is gonna happen upon release, so special exchanges do happen after the exchange breaks down in 1863. You do have a number of people, chaplains, surgeons, people who would be considered non-combatants who are initially captured would be on special release, or people who are doing particularly 
um, not well due to disease, they would sometimes do special exchange. And so Henry Davidson is one of these individuals that he's going to be released and he's going to publish his stories, like I mentioned. Um, Reverend Frederick Denson from Rhode Island, he's a reverend, so he is going to be released on special exchange, and he's going to immediately get back to Rhode Island and publish 17 different letters in his local newspaper talking about his experiences, talking about how they're being fed, what he saw, uh, people's names he was in prison with, so people know that their family members are still alive. So when we're talking about information as intelligence, it's not always for military planning purposes or even strategic tactical purposes. Some of the times it's just information for families and communities. Right? They're trying to get that information out. And so I put up a few images of the cover sheets of some of these publications. Um, and I don't know if you all can see, but a number of them are from 1862. Right? And these are the individuals who were released and paroled before the exchange broke down. So when we did have a regular Dix cartel exchange, you have a number of individuals who are released. And many of these are talking about their transport to prison. So how were they transported? Were they on boats? Were they on trains? Were they fed well? Who are the units? Where are the units coming from? Are they from the, the deep south? Are they local units? <laughs> Um, again, how are they being fed? Uh, fed? Frederick Cavada, who is actually, he's kind of famous. He was captured um, at Gettysburg. He's a Cuban-American. He's going to be writing about how they were fed, and he makes this statement about how the soup they received was only salt, water, and bacon, and the situation was so bad that he thought maybe the bacon walked into the pot on its own accord. Um, <laughs> So some of these are going to use humor to just illustrate how bad it was. Even the pig doesn't even want to live there because it's so bad, <laughs> right? And, and he's going to publish his shortly after his is released as well. So we have a range from 1862 to 1865 of these prisoners trying to get their stories out there and talking to military officials. Another way they're going to do this is upon release or exchange is talking to the actual officials, not just publishing. So um, General Benjamin Butler... He is actually going to interview a number of people, especially when he's hearing about how horrifically they're being treated and see if they have to maybe adapt their policy of the prisoners in their care. So we're going to have the rise of re a retaliation policy out of that. Also, the U.S. Sanitary Commission is going to interview a number of prisoners and see like, hey, we've been sending supplies to southern prisons. Have you gotten any? Right? And they're also going to adjust policy. So it might not surprise you, the Confederacy was not doing too well by 1864 and 1865. So when they get boxes of medicine, food, clothing, Confederate soldiers are going to pilfer from those boxes and leave only a limited number for the prisoners. Right? So maybe they should stop sending supplies if the actual prisoners who need them aren't getting them. So it's not just, again, military intelligence. Sometimes it's government intelligence going for policy changes, or even more like private companies who are supporting the war effort. So that's all I have for you today. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Derek Mallett, who's going to talk about German POWs. And unlike mine, there actually are interrogations. <laughs> um, and, they're, and they're better fed, <clears throat> I would argue. Much better, <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. Um. Yes. So thank you to you also for joining me in this endeavor and for a great presentation. So it's really interesting stuff. So I'm going to try to, uh, so again, my thanks also. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. So, um, uh, so thanks for having us and for coming out today. Uh, and again, thanks for, for joining me in this. So I'm going to try to draw a little comparisons for you. Clearly in the 75 years between the American Civil War and World War II, there's been some technological changes that shape what people can and are willing to do with prisoners of war, right? So um, this is what I'm, so what I'm looking at is actually a group of um, about 33, 3,400 German prisoners that were brought to the United States. They were put in a secret interrogation facility in Fort Hunt, Virginia. Um, this is uh, very much British style. Most of the American officers had learned from the British. Some of them had been sent to London to learn specifically with British officers. And what they, so this is a, an, a program that, well, let me back up for one second. So initially, the U.S. envisions two of these, which they built. So there was one on the West Coast uh, in Tracy, California, that was designed for Japanese prisoners of war, and then Fort Hunt, Virginia, that was designed for German prisoners of war. The Allies quickly realized that they're not going to get near the volume of Japanese prisoners of war, although they, there were some there. Uh, 
Uh, so they start using Camp Tracy for some German prisoners as, as, as well. Uh, but Fort Hunt is still the main place where the most valuable German prisoners of war would be sent. And so this is a combination of three programs that sort of triangulate uh, at Fort Hunt. So the first one was called the Military Intelligence Research Service. They, they brought tons, uh, like 27 tons of captured German documents. These things really made the rounds. And so they started off as the London uh, military document section and it became, uh, it gets moved. Part of it goes to Fort Hunt, part of it goes to Camp Ritchie. Then they get merged and eventually they all end up at Fort Hunt. But part of this is American officers researching in German documents, okay? This was paired with, they could listen to German prisoners and interrogate them and then double check that with what they found from the captured German documents. So it's a kind of a check on the information they're getting from, from prisoners of war. And the other program is less related to the other two, but actually truthfully the most interesting part of it, which was this is, so uh, MISX was actually the, it was a program designed to aid American prisoners of war. All right. So these are, these are the guys who built, like, they, they worked with American companies, um, like Rawlings and um, American game manufacturers, and they could um, wind baseballs with radio components in it, and they could divide them up into, like, a case of baseballs, and there's one radio component in each baseball, and they would train, like, one member of each air crew that if you're ever captured and you get a box of baseballs sent to you from a fake charity in the United States, Here's how you put the parts together. And like the balls are, you take this ball, this is this part, you unwind them and you can put it together and make a radio out of it, right? Or you could get your Monopoly board or whatever game you have and you could peel the board apart and there was a map in there. So wherever this air crew was gonna go, they would send the maps of the general area of where they thought they'd been captured, right? And they did this with playing cards. You could peel off, you get a whole deck of cards and they, could, they would train these prisoners. So if you get, you know, the uh, three of diamonds is going to be sector H of your layout map for the whole area that you were, uh, your area of operations for the bombing run, right? So anyway, this is a fascinating program. The bad news is they were forced to uh, destroy all the records when the war ended. So the only thing we have left, there's two things. There are a memoir that was written by the general who ran it, or the colonel, excuse me, who ran it. And then there was also a, a, some of the manufacturers kept some of these things. So if you travel to, you know, various manufacturing plants that were involved in this, you might see a, you know, here's a baseball that has a, you know, part of a receiver in it or something like that. So anyway, it's a fascinating program, but the whole thing is about prisoners of war, right? Anyway, what I'm looking at is MISY, which was the Captured Personnel Material Branch. So this is the POW. So again, they're going to do both interrogations. So they're, this is the different side of it. So they would, uh, they would interrogate prisoners that capture and surrender uh, in Europe, but what they sent them to Fort Hunt for was they wanted, they targeted prisoners that they thought had specific kinds of information. So there was a lot of technical specialists that were sent to Fort Hunt. And then later, the U.S. didn't seem too interested in high-ranking officers until the very end of the war. But eventually some of these uh, gentlemen find themselves at Fort Hunt also. Okay. But so what they're going to do is they're going to mix this. And so they would interrogate them. And then they also took the British techniques and hung microphones in the light fixtures and sometimes in the walls. And then they would listen to them and try to pair up. The idea was that you also would, you could put a stool pigeon in too, right? Which is an American officer who's uh, playing the role of a German POW and who's a roommate with a German POW. And he casually says, oh, so what did you tell these interrogators? Is, were you telling them the truth? And, or try to steer them into conversations about certain things. And meanwhile, we have German and Austrian refugees that are listening with headsets on and would record the information that they thought was most useful, right? And then they could pair that too, right? Because if you just had um, an interrogation with a prisoner and he gives you one story and then he goes back to his room and tells his roommate, man, I just totally lied to these guys because it's actually something else, right? Then they could sort of, again, they can kind of triangulate this information. So that's the sort of the background on it. What, I, what I'm going to focus on here is a, a real small subset of this, okay? These four hunt reports so what they got from these prisoners, the reports number somewhere in the 1600 to 1700 range. Most of them have been lost. And there's about 240 left. And these were reports that were actually sent to the U.S. Army European Theater of Operations. So headquarters U.S. Army in Europe between um, spring 1944 and June 1945. So it's about 15, 16 months. Okay? There's all kinds of things in these reports. 
there's a list of all the stuff that, that you can get. A lot of these were like the biggest number about war production. So all these like technical details about factories and when they operate and you know who's, who's on what shift because they're trying to avoid bombing forced laborers and, and things like that. Right? But what I find particularly fascinating are these German morale reports because well, they actually got to the point when they, they wanted to know what these Germans thought of a variety of things. And the Americans seemed really interested in what the Germans thought of them. Like, what did you think about, uh, like, American tactics and American weapons, right? So this stuff becomes really fascinating to look at, right? And so, again, sorry to keep giving you a list of information here, right? You get a lot of talk of, like, and these reports will talk about what the prisoners thought about. When do you think the war is going to end? Can Germany still win? Or are they a Nazi or are they not a Nazi? Uh, or what do they think of Hitler? But these reports actually are not particularly revealing about these topics, right? Because... What would you expect they're going to say? The longer the war goes on, how many Nazis do you think are left by, you know, May of 1945? Nobody's going to own up to that in April, May of 45, because they can see, you know, the handwriting's on the wall, right? And this is exactly what you get out of these reports. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the degradation of their views about Hitler and whether they're Nazis, and of course they don't think the war's going to end well for them. So these aren't particularly enlightening, but what they thought of some of these other topics really is. So one of the questions that the American interrogators were really interested in was what the Germans thought of the Allied nations. They called them the United Nations. Of course, we're not talking about that organization because it doesn't exist yet. They just mean, what do you think of the Americans, the British, and the Russians? Right? And this one's interesting in one regard because, I mean, who do you think the German prisoners are going to say was their favorite of those three? given that they're in the United States. Of course, almost to a person, they all said, of course, America's the best. And we also like the British, but not quite as much. And we really don't like the Russians, all right? So, and that doesn't change. So apparently the U.S. got the answer they wanted, and then they stopped asking the question. So this is one category that goes away after about halfway through. So after about August of 1944, after the successful invasion of Normandy, this question suddenly disappears from all these reports. They got the answer we wanted, so let's just stop asking the question, okay? Related to that, though, and, and kind of by contrast here, is the, the Americans, are, again, were really interested in what the Germans thought of them, right? And this one's, this one's very different, because what the Germans tended to say was they wanted, they wanted the Germans to rank order who they thought the best soldiers were. Well, again, who do you think the Germans were going to say were the best soldiers? Of course, the Germans, right? Many of them would also say the Russians. So they would say the Germans and the Russians are the best, followed by the British, and the Americans were on the bottom, right? Which is kind of an interesting twist. Now, most of these prisoners would then go on to say, they would qualify that and say, it's not that we don't think American soldiers are brave, because they are. We just think America relies too much on its materiel, like they've got big artillery guns, and they're better than ours, and they have way more resources. So we have to fight the old-fashioned way, kind of. This is kind of the, the thing you get, right? And what's interesting about this to, is kind of to ask, maybe with all of these, these questions, is why, is the Ameri why are the Americans asking these questions, and why would the Germans answer the way that they do, right? In some ways, it's, I mean, this is, in some ways, why would the Americans ask? Well, in some ways, it's kind of like an um, after-action report, in a way, right? If you can get, uh, who, who might better know the effect of an American tactic than the people that it had been used on, right? So there's some logic behind these questions. But the fact that they keep getting the same answer over and over again, but they keep asking this one, says they're also looking for something else. And I, I suspect it's that the, the U.S. military has emulated the German military for quite some time by the Second World War and almost admires it. And there's some other, many other factors that sort of suggest this is true. And the British Army was also guilty of this also. And they seem to be looking for a different answer. Like they're almost, in some ways, almost seeking a little approval from, from the Germans. Again, because this becomes, this is such a feature of some of these reports like they almost take their comments almost a little too seriously. And there's even commentary later, you know, the, the famed German armor commander, Heinz Guderian, his son, or his grandson, excuse me, uh, Gunther Guderian, was later in the Bundeswehr in the 1990s. And he was the, the Bundeswehr liaison to the 7th Corps, the U.S. Army 7th Corps at Fort Bragg. And he says, he tells this great story about how he went into the 7th Corps commander's office one day, and he said the, the American commander had two portraits on his wall. One was Patton, and the other one was his grandfather. So he said here, you know, in 1990s, there's still some, at least some admiration uh, for the German army. So, uh, but this is one, but what also is interesting about these reports is that many of these prisoners 
actually couldn't speak to some of this. So the Americans are so interested in the opinions of these prisoners. Most of these, it would be a rare German soldier who had fought the British, the Russians, and the Americans, all three. So they're asking them to compare them. Most of them couldn't do it, right? Which is an interesting, I won't call it a flaw, but it's an interesting twist in what the Americans are trying to accomplish here because they're asking questions that the people that they're asking actually really can't answer. So what you get is a lot of hearsay, and like here's the common perception amongst the German army about how the Americans fight or how the Russians fight. A lot of them couldn't actually speak to it. Anyway, the, the, the last couple things, I just a, a couple more of these that are that I kind of pair together that are actually more useful. So I would argue these two are the most useful aspects of these sort of opinion or morale reports. One of these is the Americans were also really interested in what the German prisoners could say about strategic bombing, like how effective or how impactful was the combined bomber offensive that's bombing Germany, right? And ideally, you would have sort of two reasons for bombing civilian populations, right? One would be to undermine civilian morale, which pretty much all the belligerents are doing in World War II, all the major ones, or to undermine war production. And so they would ask the prisoners this individually, like, what do you, how's this affecting civilian morale? How's it affecting war production? And what's most interesting about this one is that they actually divided the prisoners by those who had actually experienced bombing and those who hadn't. Because many of them had been fighting at the front lines for months and months, hadn't even been home. Some of them had never actually suffered an Allied bombing of, of a German city. So they had no idea what it looked like. Right? But some of them had. Now, what was most interesting about this that plays into a much larger, and I won't get into this, but a much larger argument about whether strategic bombing is really effective or not is that the prisoners told the Americans early on, all the prisoners who had suffered bombing said, it doesn't work. You're not going to undermine civilian morale. In fact, it just makes people matter. Ordinary German civilians who have been bombed are even more, more likely to resist you than the ones that hadn't been. And all the prisoners who had not suffered bombing were the ones who said, well, I don't know, that might be effective, or it really makes us fearful. But the ones that had suffered through it said, no, it's, it's of no value to you. Right? And you see that the German prisoners telling American interrogators some interesting things that the Americans will eventually, and the British, will come to later on their own. So by early of 45, both com the British Bomber Offensive Commander Arthur Harris and U.S. Army Air Force's Commander Hap Arnold both make comments to the same effect, right? That basically, uh, we're finding that this doesn't really work, right? We're not undermining civilian morale, and it doesn't have a great impact on, on war production either. And they were actually being told that by German POWs about five months prior to that. So, again, some interesting information that they are getting. But, again, to note that in this case, they're actually, the, the interrogators noted which ones had actually experienced it and which ones had not, which was different than what they had done with many of these other categories. And then the last one um, is, is, is kind of similar in that the fact that all the prisoners had experience with this is that they also asked the prisoners how effective everybody's propaganda was. The German, the British and the American and the Russian propaganda. Like, how, how effective is this on you and on the civilian population, okay? And so, and, and there's sort of three themes, really two important themes that emerge from this, right? One, you, again, that you would exactly expect, right? The German prisoners say, well, the longer the war goes on, the less effective German propaganda is on its own people, right? Shocking, right? Because it's kind of hard to keep telling stories about the great German victory when there's British, American, and Russian soldiers on German soil. It just becomes a difficult proposition, right? Um, but what was really fascinating about this part of it is actually that the prisoners, large percentages of them, loved the BBC. In fact, it was, and this is an interesting commentary on sort of information operations, right? But they actually found that large percentages, like somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of German soldiers were listening to the BBC. Right? And this is, some of this is as much as like late 1944 and into 1945 because they began to, they trusted it because they felt like the stories they were hearing from British broadcasting were much more reliable than what they were being told by their own government. Right? And British and BBC was by far more popular than anybody else's propaganda. Right? So they said much fewer of them listened to American radio broadcasts, partly because they couldn't receive it. Like American broadcasts were much weaker, so a lot of them couldn't get it. And where, the, where BBC was broadcast more, or had a much stronger signal, right? And they didn't like Soviet broadcast radio Moscow because it had too much communist indoctrination. So understandably, that turned, that turned them off, right? But it was interesting to note, again, if you're thinking about uh, the effectiveness or how you evaluate the effectiveness, 
this was a great way to look at that because they got this, again, I got a consistent commentary from these prisoners about how important the BBC was, and a lot of them could relate stories about how it affected their own unit or how they found out stuff from the BBC that they hadn't gotten from, you know, German, the German government or German military or whatever, whatever they're listening to on the, on the German side, okay? So again, just a couple of contrasts here in terms of information that they get from these prisoners of war. But again, it was interesting that sometimes what, all this stuff is in the same reports, which is also interesting, right? And it's a whole series that starts February of 44, March of 44, and runs until June of 45. And they ask the same questions of each group of prisoners that comes through Fort Hunt. It was interesting that these trends often would remain the same throughout, uh, and you'd be getting these, these, these same answers again and again, right? But interesting which, which questions they continue to ask and which ones they, they stop, but also which ones they acknowledge that the prisoners were actually capable of answering, had the experience to answer, and which ones um, they don't. Some of them, they just ignore that and offer this opinion in the report, uh, or again, where others, they sort of subdivide and show you, well, some of these prisoners experienced it, some of them haven't, it changed their views, uh, but they don't do the same thing uh, with all these categories, so. Anyway, but that, that is mine as well, so I, I just, before we ask any, or take any questions, I do want to note that uh, a little heads up for the next talk, is going to be our colleague, Dr. Gates Brown, He's going to speak on implications of the Korean War on U.S. policy. This will be in October, okay, October 6th. A little heads up for the next, for the next round, and then otherwise, I think we're... Yeah, do you want to go... If you guys notice right here, there's a QR code. Um, that's actually to a podcast interview with Dr. Gates Brown. So if you want to learn a little bit about him, his research, his academic background, his military background, and what he teaches at the Command and General Staff College, you can learn about that if you go two slides mm -hmm. for me, please. Um, as we're getting ready for questions is also, we do have a number of podcasts and social media. So if you guys are interested in learning more about what we do, we have one that is the Broad Gauge Gossips, which again is interviews with the professors. We just um, got Dr. Derek Maltz today before we came here to learn a little bit more about us. And then a confused heap of facts is talking about research topics, which is super fun. So if you wanna learn more about the Cold War, about the Chinese century of humiliation, the lost cause, you can listen to those as well and follow us on social media. So thank you. But if you're ready for questions, you wanna go back? Yeah. And that's Fort Hunt, by the way. Yeah, that's what's left of it, so. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, uh, I was at, uh, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and did the Air Force have, did they, have prisoners there that they interrogated because the Quonset hut that we had uh, had a graduate uh, ran a graduate school there in strategic intelligence for the Air Force and in the Quonset hut where I was well they had uh, had a mural that the prisoners had hmm. had had made and things like that with a lot of fire and things like that and did but I don't, know, I don't know what the Air Force did and what prisoners they had there at Wright Pat. Uh, I, don't, I don't know extensively what, what, like what prisoners were sent there. I think there was a little bit of interrogation going on in a lot of places. There's a lot of camps where they would send I know they got a lot of documents and things like that. Uh, yeah. there, and they translated them. I think maybe that was after the war and things like that, all yeah. the German documents. Yeah, I mean, there was, I mean certainly there were, there were more than just the two, like, these were like secret facilities where they sent like prisoners with specific types of intelligence they wanted. But I, th I think there were several other sites, um, Pine Grove Furnace in Pennsylvania and some other places where they sent prisoners that also- Has anybody done anything about the Air Force there? I don't, I, I don't know uh, off the top of my head of a specific study about that. Of course, you know, the Air Force is part of the Army and, and, and so it's the Army and the Navy that actually ran Fort Hunt together Okay. And so they brought naval prisoners and army in. Ideal. There was a lot of pilot, German pilots that go to Fort Hunt as well. Um, and there may have been more of a focus at a place like Wright-Patterson where they brought more like German, like you know, Luftwaffe kind of prisoners that would have come there for other kinds of information that maybe they didn't see as, you know, maybe a, a, a different level of intelligence they're looking for at a specialized program like that. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's an interesting question, so. Since uh, you said the uh, pr uh, German prisoners 
said since 1944 that the uh, strategic bombing did not have much effect on their war production. Uh, have you been teaching this to the Air Force since? Uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, again, ongoing debate, so, right? Um, the, the, certainly the prisoners were adamant that it didn't affect morale anymore, it actually just made it worse. Uh, the prisoners actually at one point, some of them actually thought it did impact production, but in a different way than what we were looking for. So they thought it impacted production in terms of Every time there was an air raid, they have to stop work, and people go into shelters, and they have to wait for the raid to end, and then come back and go to work. So that was the biggest thing they noted, or transportation, that the U.S. would target transportation nodes, like rail hubs and things like that. And it was having an impact as the war went on. That, that kind of stuff does, actually. Well, I mean, you look at right now in Ukraine, they're sending missiles and missiles, and, and, and the Ukrainians are, are going on. Yeah. I mean, it almost proves out. Yeah, yeah, so it does. So anyway, that's interesting, too. So. <clears throat> yeah, hey, thanks, Derek. Um, so do you know of any cases where this information was fed back to the Strategic Bombing Survey and then, and then they actually changed targets, perhaps? I, th this gets really, so that's a great question. This gets really tricky to try to tie between what they got and then what, uh, where these reports go and what they actually did with them when they got there. So I honestly have not found any direct, like, you know, smoking gun between here's something a pris like prisoner report was sent and then somebody changed a policy. And there's two or three other people, a couple of folks in Britain that are trying to tie the British reports, because the British do the same thing at Trent Park and, and Wilton Park and some of these places, that are trying to make these same connections. But they get really tenuous because it's hard to find somebody where somebody says, hey, we got this report from Fort Hunt and let's, you know, change our approach or something like that. So, I mean, in fact, these reports get sent to like Army Air Forces. So I suppose it's possible that somebody like Half Arnold would have looked at one of these, but I can't, I can't demonstrate that. So. But that's a great question. That'd be great. I wish I could find something like that that would, you know, hey, look. So, so. Angela, is, <clears throat> is there a significant difference in how the prisoners were treated um, by both sides, and does it change from 62 to 65? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, thank you. So we are going to see more suffering in the southern prisons. Um, some people argue that that was purposely done, uh, especially in the post-war period. Prisoners are going to argue that they were purposely murdered and starved. Uh, there's no actual record of that happening. Uh, most, I would argue that it's usually just a lack of planning and a lack of resources. They're struggling to feed their own prison guards and the, their own southerners, let alone prisoners in their care, right? If it's between feeding a soldier who's going to the front and feeding a prisoner, I, you know, you choose the one who's fighting on your side. Um, there is, though, a change. So once they are receiving more reports, especially from prisoners who are exchanged on special exchange or paroled, and they're in very poor health, um, I'm sure you've all seen those photographs of the prisoners who look like skin and bones. Many of those, I was actually telling um, Dr. Mallet before we started, many of those individuals are gonna die within 24 to 48 hours of having their photographs taken. Um, so once those come back, they do, the North United States institutes a retaliation policy where they're gonna limit the number of rations that they're gonna be feeding prisoners in their care, but they do 19th century math of like what caloric intake a prisoner would need. Um, so they're not starving them, but enough that they're hungry and try to institute some sort of better treatment of prisoners in the South. But it's, it's definitely worth worse in the Confederate States, but I wouldn't say because of villainy. It's just, you know, you're struggling, so you're not gonna feed the prisoners in your care. But most people die of disease, not actually of starvation. So it's dysentery, smallpox, malaria, yellow fever that are killing most prisoners. So thank you. Uh, this is for, uh, uh, this is for, this, this question is for Derek. Um, uh, you described the, uh, the uh, German prisoners being interrogated at Fort Hunt, uh, but my question is, uh, was there any concerted effort uh, on the part of the German prisoners that you know of to either limit or distort the uh, information that was going from themselves to the American interrogators? That, that's a great question, right? And a fascinating one, right? So um, my argument would be yes. I think some of the prisoners knew they were being, particularly the eavesdropping, uh, in both Britain and the United States, not all of them, or they didn't know all of the places where microphones were, 
but I was also just telling Dr. Ed on the way down here that I've got, I've got a transcript of a, of a room and a bugged conversation between two German generals that I'm absolutely convinced these guys knew somebody was listening and were just putting on a show messing with the Americans because they're having this conversation about how we should learn Russian because Russian is the language of the future. Soviet Union is going to take over the world. And I know they don't believe that. They're too smart for that. So I know they're just like, you know, yanking some American chains. But it's hard to disentangle because there's a lot of things in both the United States and particularly the UK where prisoners said some pretty damning information into microphones. And the only reason they weren't convicted on this evidence is because the British didn't want to tell anybody where they'd gotten the information in case they wanted to do it again later. And so they never used it, like war crimes, all kinds of stuff, but they wouldn't use the, inf the evidence because they don't want to give away how they'd gotten it. But, I mean, there were people admitting, I mean, I've seen the transcript of a German general admitting that he intentionally destroyed Rotterdam, I mean, Dietrich von Schultz, and Sevastopol and killed thousands of people, and he admits it into a British microphone. So either they forgot, some of them, not all of them know, but I would strongly argue that a lot of them do. And the German army actually trained all of all the guys that went into the European theater and said, if you ever get captured by the British, know that wherever they take you, there's a microphone. So don't, don't speak freely in the camp because the British love to do this kind of stuff. And so any, any German soldier that later said, oh, I had no idea there were British microphones, is, would be incorrect, right? Because they had been, they'd all been told that, that that was a possibility. So anyway. Uh, it's a great question, right? So she's making her way around here. So. Okay, Angela and Derek, w the best book in your era about prisoners of war and why? On? Prisoners of war. And it's pretty wide. It is. Mm. Wow, oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'll say, are we both in the useful captives one? We could say that one. No, that was, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not in that one, so yeah, um, <laughs> that's a good one. No, it's great. So again, there's not many books written, and some of them that are written are very much based on the, I would say, exaggeration, exaggerations written by prisoners and don't do a lot of analysis of actually what they're saying and why. Um, but the book that I, in, that we just published not too long ago from University Press Kansas, Useful Captives, is excellent because it's based out of a conference that prisoner of war historians did at the Filson and then published. So it ranges from the American Revolution all the way up to um, the modern period. So you can learn about POWs across American history, which is super fascinating. Yeah, and it was published out of Lawrence, so why not? Yeah, that is a good one. I mean, uh, I mean this is the answer. I'm, the answer I'm going to give is actually oddly unrelated to what I just talked about. But I think one of the most fascinating books that I've read about POWs, this is more particular to World War II, but it's actually a book, it's called The Anguish of Surrender. It's actually written about the American use of Japanese prisoners of war, which is exactly the opposite of what you mm -hmm. might expect. I mean, we don't get that many. There's less than 40,000 Japanese captives that, that the Americans interrogate and the British combined, but they got all kinds of information out of them, right? Because the Japanese had never been trained as to what to do if they were captured. And so, and German officer, our Japanese officers tended to abuse Japanese enlisted prisoners. So they tended to use lots of corporal punishment, slapping them about the head and shoulders, yelling at them. And so these guys would get captured and the Americans and the Brits would say, hey, you want a cigarette? You want, are you hungry? Can I get you something to drink, a cup of coffee? And they'd never been trained not to talk. So they would ask them questions. They'd tell them everything they knew. Mm -hmm. and it's a fascinating story about like, hey, maybe the best interrogation technique is just to be nice. Does yeah, we work, were, work like a charm. So. We were talking about it on the way down here. He was telling me that story. We have footage from Okinawa of a number of captured Japanese soldiers, and they're smiling, they're willingly giving information, signing their name, um, but oftentimes because they weren't expecting to be captured. Um, and so American soldier captures them, and instead of killing them like they expect it, they're handed a chocolate bar. And they're, yeah. it just, it's a mind warp. So they're like, whatever you want to know, we'll tell you. Just keep giving me candy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, literally and figuratively disarming, right? Yeah. So, uh, so. anyway, this uh, this gentleman here has had uh, has a question. He's had his hand up a couple of times. So. Thank you. Just a couple of, uh, I guess, comments and, and questions. Our family lived in uh, the Chicago area and had a farm there, hmm. and uh, had a number of German POWs who worked for our family. Oh wow! And. Uh, it was a really heavily German-American area. Mm 
So a lot of the, the Americans spoke German. And my dad spoke German you know, pretty well. And I was curious what the relationship would have been between our government authorities and people like my dad, who had the German POWs. Did they try to found, find out any information that our family could have gotten from these guys? And the way my dad characterized these prisoners were that they didn't talk a lot, but they worked hard. Yeah. And um, honestly, were fairly well fed in that area. So I've always been curious whether there was anything going on between the government, people like my dad. As far as I know, there was never any concerted effort to use like American civilians who were hiring prisoners of war to get any kind of information out of them. I mean, the biggest motive to bring the 380 some thousand Germans to America was to just to try to fill that labor shortage, which they did a pretty good job of. And I think by and large, once the American government got them hired out, they just let them be. And even with the interrogation, if you think, you know, 380 some thousand Germans here and they put 3,000 of them at Fort Hunt, that's all the ones that they thought were worth spending a considerable amount of time interrogating. And even then, they don't usually stay there that long, mm, three, four weeks, and then they would send them out to another camp. And so as far as I know, I've never seen anything that suggested they did anything else with them. The only so. Wow, wow. Yeah. And I know pretty well where they were when they were captured. Oh, do you know where they were sent? Uh, they were sent to Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Virginia. One of the Virginians. They did, because they survived the war. One got here and that was the war was over. So yeah. wow, to be captured twice. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, two days before the war was over, they were <laughs> Well, I'm also curious, too, your, your family that, that like, had German prisoners of war working for them, did they develop a relationship with the prisoners at all? No. They didn't? No. Okay. Other than, again, other than the fact that my dad could converse with them. Yeah, okay. But um, our family really didn't have a relationship, but I know that in that area, uh, that sort of thing did occur. Again, because it was heavily German-American. Yeah. The mm -hmm. whole area was. Yeah, yeah. So, Yeah. I mean, and that's what I, I just asked because that's one of the themes with German and Italian POWs in America is that all the relationships they built with locals, because again, so many Americans could speak German, that they would have, you know, people that became friends and stayed in touch for years afterwards, or occasionally soldiers who, you know, POW goes back to Europe and comes back and marries the farmer's daughter that he worked for as a POW, and, you know, that's, that's some crazy stories. So anyway, mm -hmm. great. Thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Of that 380,000, do you have any idea how many stayed? Uh, <clears throat> I had a captain that worked with me whose father was a German enlisted guy that was captured at Normandy, and he stayed in the United States. So, and, and there was a prisoner of war camp in Princeton, Maine, and mm -hmm. people talked very kindly of the Germans that were working in the woods up in, up in Maine, and I, I believe some of them stayed. Are there any numbers out there of how many stay? Uh, so officially, they were all sent back to Europe. <laughs> okay. So officially, they all had, to, according to the International Geneva Convention, they have to be repatriated. Okay. The best estimates I've seen of those who return, now whether they went to Europe and came back or found some way to stay, is was somewhere in the five, six, seven thousand range. But that's more like within the immediacy of the war. Now, and I don't think anybody has a sense of how many came back over the next 20 years because that became a much, much different story. But I think within the few years of the war, the estimates I've seen were five, five to 7,000 maybe that come back. But still, it's an interesting commentary on the fact that you were here as a prisoner of war and you want to move back. I don't think there's too many like Soviets that want to move back to Germany after World War II. So, right. So anyway, it is very interesting commentary. But you see that with German in the United States and Germans in Britain, right? That they a lot of they want to go back because it was good relationships. So anyway, that's a good question too. So I think we have time for maybe one question or wrap yeah. up. Well, I was just going to say also, um, if for the audience, if you're interested, Concordia, Kansas had a prisoner of war camp, and they have a museum. You can arrange.
um, to get a tour of, but also if you go like to the Orphan Train Museum there, um, the docents talk about some of the, the POWs who came back. I think one was a, a town doctor uh, after the war, and so mm -hmm. they're very proud of those ones. And uh, to go to your, your question about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, uh, where there was a POW camp, if you went to the officers club there in the 1980s, uh, it had a beautiful German mural all over the officers club uh, that prisoners had painted uh, during the war. So it was interesting to see that connection, uh, how we were th yeah. using them there, so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>